think like that, you're not going to make anything. You know, an awful lot of this kind of financial talk is, you know, really, really for like just a, a seasoned producer, really. In the room, 52 Jokers Wild. Welcome, everybody. It's another Friday again for In the Room with Garvin and George. And this week, our special guest is Mo O'Connell, who is an actress, writer, director and producer. And her company is called Three Hot Whiskers, which sounds pretty good. I could do one of those at this point as well, I think, with all the things that are going on. So welcome to the show, Mo. Thank you. Now, Brit, we've I, we've had a little glimpse of some of the uh, sh- some of your shorts and the and the feature film that you you put together, and uh, we're we're always very interested about how people go about putting together their their films and their packaging, and we're we're at that kind of stage where we're starting to think more kind of the, the business side of things a little bit uh, to see how people get their films and how they get them to target audiences and things. So, but we'd love to know how do you get your movies started? And what's the process that you go through? All right, well, I was just thinking, like, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> if you're looking for business kind of acumen, like, so that's not me. I mean... <laughs> oh, what you said, you're the writer, the producer, the director, the, director. the star. <laughs> you know, the weird thing is, the one step that's extra is you are the whole business, your operations, your marketing, your, 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 the content. You, there's some friend or someone that other mem- member of that company of yours that has to be sales and marketing and distribution or, or investment and finance raising and funding. So if that's not you, have you got access to that? Well, so basically, like, Three Hot Whiskies was, like, it wasn't a limited company for a very long time. It's only this year become limited. But so for years I made indie shorts and I made Spa Weekends, the indie feature film, and I would put three hot whiskeys at the end of it. But it wasn't a limited company or anything like that. So it was all just me. There was no one else. But I was running the whole show. So you were an alcoholic at three hot whiskeys to start. Then you sort of went out and did the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah basically, yeah. And, you know, being an alcoholic helps, you know, at least you're fearless. You have to be. You have to be yeah. in this game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I know that uh, we, we, we've made, um, I've made uh, a couple of feature films now. Uh, one was Filler's Walk and one that I'm working on is Monty's Quest. And much, I've worked as an editor throughout my career, but I've always done the writing and I probably did the same as you. I had some income coming in from my work, but the creative side of me wanted to get out there and do something. So I, I produced my own films. And assuming that's really what you've done, you, you, you've, you've maybe worked as an actress or something, and it's your love of filmmaking that has inspired you to do that other side. Is that something similar or is your story different to that? Um, yeah, I suppose it's kind of similar. I, um, I started off making films when I was a kid in Wicklow. I grew up in Wicklow, so I made films with a giant VHS camera. And then I had to act in them because I didn't have enough actors and stuff. And then I did like speech and drama. And I loved all of that. And I, I really liked acting as well. And so then I did, what did I do? I did lots of, um, I did a, a film production in Ballyfermot. And as I did that, I did profit share in Amdram and learned how to become a theatre actor just by doing it. And then after that, once I graduated with a film diploma, I became a professional actor because I got an agent. And then I did loads of plays around Ireland, like Wuthering Heights and the importance of being earnest and that type of thing. And I made money from that. And then I made shorts, made films then from that. And then after that, I thought a a director told me he used to teach at RADA and he told me I should apply to RADA. And initially I went, nah. And then I thought, oh, fuck it, I'll just try, just see how far I get. And then I applied to RADA and I got into RADA. So then I went to England and I did three years training at RADA and um, became like classically trained actor or whatever. Uh, but I still wanted to make films. I made three shorts for that stage and I co-produced a feature film already, and, like all no budget kind of stuff. But they've done quite well, so I was quite happy. Um, so then I came back and it was coming up to 2016 and I wanted to do something for the centenary because my, my uh, family would be kind of quite Republican, like Irish Republican and stuff. So my granny was in coming to morning and everything. So I, I made, I researched the proclamation the irish proclamation and uh-huh. i made a 1916 short corporate claim so Just now, I my filmmaking then back in ireland yeah. and then after that i didn't get too much acting work to be honest with you in ireland i didn't get audition for anything <laughs> because only americans get irish parts you're going there's, yeah. There's, yeah, it, yeah. it works the opposite way it's it, it's that paddy go whackery sort of you don't have irish actors playing irish actors in movies you have mm. Americans playing Irish actors in movies. Well, I did, that's, that's my the perspective. Americans, <laughs> the Americans don't believe the accents, isn't it? I so can you a... do all the American accents going the opposite way? Yeah, yeah 
Yeah, I do. Yeah, I love doing accents. I love doing accents. Yeah, that's but, cool. Uh, but yeah, so, but then, like, so then I just, like, work in coffee shops and things like that. Tons of them. Uh, well, so actually, I think that's where Jennifer Aniston was as well, Mo and Friends. So that's where acting, that, that's where actors get picked up. You know, yeah, you, but it's which coffee shop? I mean, it's no point in being in the granny one at the bottom of the road. You got, you've got to be in Hollywood Heights or the Hollywood Boulevard, or I don't actually know where where this where acting has moved to in terms of getting picked up and getting noticed. And you know, yeah. has the interesting moved. thing about uh, being an actor and working in coffee shops and and or even anything like my sons when they went through university, they both uh, worked in Sainsbury's. And they, they learned sales skills in Sainsbury's and how to deal with customers and how to deal with people. And I think that in a coffee shop, I, I mean, I worked in a coffee shop before uh, and I used to write when I was at film school in a coffee shop. And you got to see people and you can people watch and you could see the psychology that was going on. And it gave you it gives you ideas for, for writing scripts. I'm sure that's there's I'm sure there's a lot of ideas comes from that experience. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, like when you have the energy, it's like it's really hard. Like coffee shop stuff is not easy. Everyone thinks, oh, you work in a coffee shop, it's an easy job. Yeah, it's, it's quite physical, you know? And when it gets busy, you're like, things. it's like, I'm not thinking about a script at that point. Are you an expert barista is what we want to know. Are you just slapping the Nescafe, spooning Nescafe <laughs> in? I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good barista now, I have to say, but, um, and I, like, I won't like it going into coffee shop with their bad milk be really annoyed if they burn my milk right oh no that yeah. actually the gas thing is we found a common denominator between us all <laughs> you've worked in a coffee shop he's in a coffee shop writing i own a coffee shop so i mean <laughs> i am my own best customer except for i thought it was star books and it was actually star burks there was no there's a bunch of grannies in the corner bringing their own tea bags with them looking for hot water and i'm in the other side going Taken up four chairs by myself because I'm I'm quite a big guy. So, but it was, I, I I was not meant to get into business of coffee shops. I was actually an accountant and I was doing my accountancy work in the corner. So it's like you being you could be writing your next um, you know screenplay while sitting in the coffee shop. So what what you see in front of you is not someone with no job doing nothing passing the time of day. It's actually the next breakout Quentin Tarantino movie in the making. You know, so do you do your best work in coffee shops in terms of writing your next screenplays? No, no, I never. No, I, I have to write it by myself. I can't deal with that distraction. Some people like distraction. I, I don't. I like to be by myself and talk to myself. And I like to, like anything I find funny, I'll just write it down or I'll make me giggle. And I, I mean, if I was doing that coffee shop, I would just get self-conscious. People would think I'm insane, you know? Yeah. So, or I'll, well, I'll say the lines out to myself. See, oh, so I think we've got something yeah. in common there, George, now, because I'm an outside talker. I think I'm talking inside my head. I'm not. I'm actually <laughs> talking outside. So we're, we're very alike because we're actually having that conversation with our, me, myself and I, our super ego, our idle libido. We're having that chat about what will work and not work. That's why I need the other three seats around me in a coffee shop, because I'm having the full on discussion. You know, it, he, it, it he seems actually, like you're doing the same from one seat and moves to the other so he can actually listen to what No, the actually, there's are. the thing. You're, you're, <laughs> you're actually playing all the roles. You're playing the writer. You're actually doing acting out the parts. You're, 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 you're visualizing it as you go. But then you have to, you know, to bring it to screen, you're saying, it's, it's, I'm sure it's, what we're finding is it's harder and harder and harder for indie, indie producers to attract any type of finance because the investor has left the market. He was never really in the market. It was a very risky investment. Ending under two million, they can't figure out how they're going to get paid. The Netflixes are reducing what they're offering, the, the streamers, the Amazons. They're taking all the upside and they're removing the reward for any investor. So what we're finding is how are you going... Actually, you as a prime example now, in the absence of you being hired onto someone else's movie, have you a new feature in development and... Are you moving more closer to that business hat to basically maybe attract that money to get that made? Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard to kind of like have like, you know, a two year plan or a three year plan in the film genre that, you know, acting yeah. like, you know, you can make shit up if you want. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> well, that's what we're doing. That's exactly yeah, yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, no, so I basically, I'm working with Screen Ireland. I got funding to develop a feature film for my short film, Girls. Oh. So I'm co-writing that now with Gemma Cray. 
I actually, I'm going to stop you right there for a second. I actually watched your short, girls. I'm, I'm still traumatized. Okay. You know, I was, I was led very, very, you know, oh, this is going to be about a bunch of girls, this now. Oh, no, no, honestly, please go watch that one. And if you come back, <laughs> you're not traumatized. I don't <laughs> no, I can see how you're going to get the screening to the next level because that, that is... It is quite. It, it, it's addressing a lot of an awful, an awful lot of issues, all right. But I, I, I was. I didn't know what I was about to source or watch, and therefore, if I had been in the movies, I would have been in next door watching the comedy. That was a bit, yeah. bit hard for me to watch. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, no, it is because like, I usually make comedies, but uh, that is probably one of you know that's a social realist drama, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so the feature um, has developed on from that, and we have our first draft, and we were talking to producers and things like that, and. Um, yeah, so it's just about finding the right production house for it. And you apply for more Screen Ireland funding, basically, with that production house behind you. Mm. And then eventually production funding, and you shoot the thing then. So that's yeah. that's the plan, but we have to get the right producer, the right production company. And how, how many versions of the script would you go through? Because we were talking to a chap recently who went through nine versions and spent the last 10 years working on it. Oh. And, and you kind of think, well... that. I, I'm an editor and, and I would normally edit things, which is also storytelling process. And there is a point where you do something and then you kind of go, OK, well, I'll tweak it a little bit, but then I need to leave it because it, there, there, no one's going to pay me any more to do any more than what we're doing. Uh, and if you keep working at it, you can actually pull the thing. It's like a jumper. You can pull it apart accidentally yeah. and it, it's turned into something that's more of a mush than anything else. Do, would you have a process that you'd go through to limit the number of times you go through writing a script or would you keep working away at it? Uh, no, I, I mean, it's a kind of intuitive with me. So I'm not, uh, it's this thing, I'm, I'm really bad at telling people what to do because I kind of just follow my own intuition on stuff. And if I'm happy with something, I'll shoot it. Like Hold on a second. You said you're a director and you're very bad at telling people what to do now. That's, that's, oh, that's no, like, yeah, no, I am bad at but I can't like, you know, when I'm writing something, you know, like yeah. it's kind of unusual when an idea comes to you, you know. And it's kind of special and you kind of nourish it. And then you uh, have a bit of courage and you kind of, you try to bring it into the world and stuff. But you have to be very careful about who you show it to and stuff. So, say, for instance, with Proclaim, that came out, that was the first draft, basically. And I had done loads of research and I had... So a lot of the things that Connolly says and all the printers say, they did say those things. Like, I researched it that much and that's that's what they said. And they said that that, that is what Connolly said. So I made sure that I got a lot of, you know, old Dublin speak right. But when I showed it to like some DOPs who didn't end up getting the job, like, they would tell me, oh, you know, people don't talk like that. You have to, you have to take that out. And I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. And <laughs> didn't take it. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't work with them, you know. I just thought they're not the right person for this because this is, I don't know, I had a strong feeling about it. And how, yeah. how, how do you verify that? How do I, you know. Now, the great thing about that, Mo, is, is you were in, because it was a low budget or you were in control, you could choose to, they're not right for me. I am in control of all the moving parts. Yeah. Whereas if you would actually bring your script, let's say you've got this new script and it's now going to be, you're looking for the co-production house. It's your, you as artists nearly have to start letting go because the money men might go, we've got to change the language because the mark, the audience that we're, we want to get won't understand it. So it becomes the, the playoff of the artist and creativity against the finance and the business aspect of it. Are you, are you precious or are you able to let go? Well, I mean, it would depend on what they're asking me to let go. So that's the thing. Like, I mean, if it was something that I just, you know, that, that you know, I wouldn't go with them then, you know, and that's I'd, it, yeah. I'd back away and I'd find someone else who's, who's right for it. But I mean, if there was something that I could let go, then I would. I mean, I'm not necessarily precious, but I would fight for something that I thought was right, you know. Um, oh, that's great. And I think that's an important aspect because I know that uh, about 20 years ago, there was a project that we were working on uh, and I'd actually got a whole load of people in Belfast to act in it and we got crew and we got everything else. It was a low budget film uh, next to no budget. It was, it was, it was something we wanted to do to start the thing ro rolling, but I'd, I'd met a producer and every time I went to talk to her, the, she, the budget was going up. And, and by the time I went to other meetings, I suddenly wasn't as involved. And then the team wasn't involved and Who everybody the, else. Uh, sorry. The director. I was supposed to be the director. And in the end, what happened? Well, they then were, they were putting somebody else in to be the director. And, oh, and I said, yeah. right, OK, yeah. I own the rights to this script. I'm now pulling it completely yeah. out of your hands. Oh. Because 
Absolutely. And that and that's uh, now I didn't eventually make that film because I, it, the writer, I gave him the rights back to do the film and he got another group to do it somewhere in America. Yeah. But, but but we'd built up this this collection and, and it was really frustrating because we'd made lots of shorts. We we were going to try and see if we can make a, a feature film. And this, the, you know, what, what happened was this person had come in and unraveled the whole thing. It's like that it's, it's the jumper scenario again. They'd pulled the cord and it all fall, fell to pieces uh, because the way that they were then applying themselves. But we could have actually made that film and demonstrated our worth. But as it was going, it, it would have been, none of us would have been involved in that project. And, and you have to be so careful. And I do think we've heard a lot of people that said that they don't know how to say no. But I think there are times where you just, you just say, no, I'm not having that. I'm not going in that direction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really hard. It's a, it's a pull and tug all the time, you know, like going forward or going back, saying yes, saying no. And it's really, I mean, that's why life is hard, you know, because <laughs> you don't know what is the, you know, are you right or are they right? It's, it's, it's really hard to know sometimes, but uh, really follow your joy, I would say. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's your project and you're allowed to make mistakes as well, even if they are right, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, it's, it's still yours. And if you want to go off and make the film and, it, you know, it, you know, there might be imperfections and there's imperfections with every every film. And, and then, oh, that's where the businessman absolutely. here jumps back in and goes, <laughs> I, I keep on saying to George, it's not yours anymore. What it is, is it, no, no, to take the language, he's in the sense of the journey from short to feature is a journey from, you know, let's say no budget to what do you think that feature is? Is it a half a million something, a million, a two million? What, what, what size is that feature in your mind based on the first pass of your understanding of it without doing a line budget? Because that means it's beyond the grant money or the soft money. It's someone else's money. The co-production house is not a co-production house. It's getting its money from some investor. And that investor wants a return. It wants a scene and it wants a paid back. So yeah. not, the sort of language that I'm using normally is the money is facilitating the vision and the creativity getting to be made to get to an audience. But it's no longer any ones. Actually, it's 100% owned by the investor. It is not owned by the scriptwriter or, or the, the cameraman or anyone else because everyone got their payday. How do you feel about that sort of ideology about that journey? Or oh, like I definitely understand it, but I still think at the end of the day, like, you know, it's a bet. You know what I mean? Yeah. No one knows the outcome. Um, but usually it's a hedge bet. It's people don't bet with an idea they're 99% time going to lose. And that's the problem with raising finance for indie production. So very few are getting made. And the journey you're currently on, even with the soft money involved, is it has to attract the hard money and will it. And what it's saying is this will get made. It has an audience. Enough of an audience will watch it for the investor to get his money back and the return. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but that, I mean, that's what every, every film, not just with indie film, that's what the big... Oh, no, it, is. but yeah. indie film is harder because it doesn't have the audience. It doesn't have a, a pre-sale with Netflix or the streamers. You know, the big films in Ireland currently are just here for the production tax credit. They're not here for to create indie, create, you know, to, to finance uh, low-budget production movies that may or may not have an audience. They have an audience, if you don't make sense. Yeah, yeah, but I still think as well, if they don't, you know... Yeah the director if they undermine the director they've undermined you know they've undermined their oh film. no no yes there's no yeah. one like it is taking a bet on the director so so the director you know is the one who has to say at the end of the day regardless whether it's an indie film or you know Actually, an interesting thing we read yesterday now is this chap. I, get, I never got his name right. I'm hoping George get like can remember his name. It's this guy <laughs> Stephen that. Follows or Stephen Fellows. Fellows. I don't know Fellows. which one it is. It Stephen, will not Stephen stick. Fellows. It won't stick in my head. Stephen Fellows, and he wrote an article based on the research in the actually about first time directors versus second and third time directors. And the article actually proved through the statistics that the bet was equal based on your, if you were a proven director, it didn't mean the film was going to be successful. It was actually, you had as much chance of a first time director being the film being successful as well. So that was actually, you know, like a, a fallacy. You didn't have to worry about, you, you, it actually meant you had a better chance, maybe in my books, give the first timer the chance, the opportunity, and they might bring something new to the game. I mean, often they, you know, they hit on a zeitgeist, so they hit on something that's happening, like uh, what's his name, Ari Aster, or something. You know, when he made um, Hereditary, Hereditary did quite well, didn't it? But I mean, I think I think it was around the time, like um, you know, people were quite scared. There was like you know, um, there was a threat of another recession or something, and. 
Yeah. You know, uh, so there's th things that happen kind of globally, kind of psychologically to people at the exact same time. So when a film comes out uh, by a new director, you know, it can it can it, it can blow up. Um, so, and I think I think I because that. yeah, the, because a new director will have a fresh look on the way, the fresh perspective on what's going on on the world, which which if the money people came in, they're looking for something that that, that previously generated an in income form they want to repeat, which is why we constantly have sequels. But with a fresh eye, the only way you can do it is if it's a new director coming through and trying to push their their view of the world. And I think that becomes an important part of that that kind of process. Now, I mean, we we I've done at least two feature films now with without a particular budget, but we've we've worked something out as a producer with them and this this next part of the journey is to to see how we get funding for a project and we've we've got a model that we're going to work with that one you'd mentioned earlier on that you'd co-produced uh, a film were you were you acting in that or was your role purely as the co-producer and if it was what were you doing i was a co-producer so this is like very much like no budget kind of a thing but it was uh, called fur coat no niggers and it was before i went to rada and it's uh it was one of ireland's first gay romantic comedies uh, it's a feature film and it opened That's up. my throwaway saying. I've got about 30 shows where I'm trucking that in every other sentence. <laughs> yeah, actually, what, what, what I am is, I, I, I am actually fur coat, no knickers. I have a big house, no money. You know, it's, it's like, it's, it's a big car, but no money for the petrol. It, it's, 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 but that's it. It's about perception. And actually another bit, I think you're going to like it is, it's smoke and mirrors. So it's fur coat, no knickers, smoke and mirrors. And three whiskeys by the looks of it. And yeah, I think yeah. you go out disco dancing and you're going to make things happen. Because you got to get out, you got to network to get work. And that's what I think you were saying earlier on. Yo, know, the thing is, we all have the skill sets, but it's but, who but, gets seen, who gets heard, gets the opportunity. Yeah. But tell us a little bit more about your process, though, so that, because we know what Garvin's process is, but it'd be really good to get your. I'm looking your for me knickers now. That's I just say. Yeah, that's it. You, you got away. looking knickers, and we'll get, <laughs> get Mo to tell about her process. I think that would be quite interesting at this stage. Um, just like starting to write and film it, or no, I, I, I was the it was the producing, the co-producing, because you were saying that you were co-producing. So it's it's again a little bit of an insight of your experience of that that role that you took on for that particular film, and and what did you find yourself doing? Sure. Uh, so it was a friend of mine called Paul Ward. So he was he'd written it and he uh, was going to direct it, and he'd he'd done a short of it. We we had applied to Screen Ireland. They were initially interested. And then they eventually said, no, they weren't going to give it any funding, whatever. So we just thought we'd do, we'd do it ourselves. So we put in our own money. I, I, I put in money. So that's, I put in my own money. So that's. Did you get it back? Did you get it back? You're an investor. <laughs> no, no, we, I, no, there was like, a, I think it was about three producers on and we, and we all put money into it. And then I just basically organized uh, the shoot. I got a really good DOP, um, Arthur Mulhern, who had just graduated from DLIDT. Uh, he also shot girls as well, actually. Um, and he went on to England then. He went to the National Film School over there. He's awesome. And so he shot it and uh, we shot it on, God, I can't remember. It was, it was, it was a really good camera at the time, but it wasn't, it wasn't the best. It was like the second best or something. Yeah, um, red something, red something. I know, uh, I, I actually don't think it was a red was just coming out at the time. And we were like, oh my yeah. God, there's this new camera called a red. But um, anyway, so, and then, uh, we, so I, I was part of like an acting troupe and, um, we cast from there because you know we all knew each other and uh we'd worked with each other we, we knew what we could do and stuff and so paul and i cast from there and um got some really great actors and really great performances kind of it was kind of a you know a romantic comedy basically between two guys and um then we got some uh support from the gay community as well um and we opened up gays in, in, in dublin so basically it was just organizing the shoes kind of production management is what i did i drove people around I gave money, I paid people. Um, yeah, I gave people gifts and thanked them and made sure that everyone felt happy and lots of food, good food. That's it was kind of just basic stuff. Like, you know, it's not, and I mean, we did, we did sell it to TLA in Florida in the end. Um, so, but I mean, like, no, that's great because I'm here in business again. You did, you as yeah. you said, you you were doing it without the official. You, you were an investor, even though it wasn't it wasn't in shares in the, the company. Everyone had a had an investment in it. You sold it in the end to a, to a, this, an age a, dis, a distributor or to a consumer, whatever. So you sold it. So yeah. you made it. You raised funds. 
you made it, you've done the locations, got the actors, your crew, done the whole project management end to end. You did, this is an entire business and then yeah. you went off and sold. And you had a target and audience. You, and you got sponsorship in the middle. So that was one, that's business 101 end to end. You're going, you do, you're wearing about 15 other hats you didn't mention on top of producing, directing, acting and all the rest of it. You're, you're, so I'm very, very impressed. You know, but yeah. the thing is, if it was formalized, then you would have saw there was an awful lot of compliance and contracts and suing capability and insurance risk. That was my accountant going, God almighty, if you had known all of that, you, done, you would have done nothing. Yeah, I had my release forms and all, you know, like all of that type yeah. of stuff. And did you make, I said you made, the interesting thing there was, you said you sold it. Did you actually break even? Did you just make a little? Did you just lose a little? No, we didn't break even. Not at all. Not in the slightest. So <laughs> you want to attract my investment into your next one, do you? <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice. But I mean, yeah, it just takes ages to get to that point. I mean, unless you're born rich, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to begin in the filmmaking community and make money immediately. Yeah. No, and that's it is. It's but it's it's actually even the next step you were saying is it's very very difficult to stay motivated and keep on going yeah. and oh, not yeah. just go get a job. Yeah. Because you know. Yeah. So you're, well, I mean you're I, I, I mean I've suffered that. Uh, I mean that second movie that I'm still working on uh, was shot 12 years ago. Uh, my my I was I'd edited it or most of it and was working on graphics and my dad died. And then every time I went back to the movie, uh, I actually got this sinking feeling every time I opened it up in the edit suite, I had to close it down. Yeah. And it's only now that, because I looked at it about 18 months ago and I had the same kind of, oh, almost like nausea. And, and now I've opened it up and I'm looking at it as a fresh movie that almost as though I haven't seen it before. And I'm now reworking. I edited the first six scenes last night. And I went, oh, I can work on this now. Yeah. And that and it's that motivation is is coming back, but it's only because we've been talking to other filmmakers and you kind of went, We got a family of people together to make that movie that I want to make sure that they know that there was something there to, you know, for all the effort they did, even though it was twelve yeah. years ago. And I think that that is something again, being part of a, a filmmaking community, you said you were part of a troupe. I think that's where you need that support. And I know with Garvin, I'm now working with him. Uh, all the time and it's that's helping motivate but if you're on your own you can you can get into a kind of sense of despair because it is such a hard job trying to get those films really put together hard. yeah i mean have you experienced anything similar to that in your own career um so, similar to kind of leaving being just just a project that sort of seemed to struggle and and you you didn't know when to get let go or whether to keep on going with it um well there was a short called motherhood which was very difficult to bring into the world um it was funny because it was about motherhood and it was I, I always see every film as like you're giving birth well that's how i view it anyway you know and some of them come out very easily and joyfully and this one had a fight like she didn't want not want to come into the world and i was just Oh my God, like, you know, clashing schedules. There was a really difficult DOP initially for the first shoot. And I was like, I, I got a new DOP and be shot because mm -hmm. stuff was terrible. And um, and she was just horrible and unsatisfied as well with everyone. So, so, I, so I got a new guy in and then, and then that was easy to work with him. And then uh, then people's schedules, they, they, the cast really wanted to do it, but everything started to clash mm -hmm. and... Then I told the producer not to look at the, it was a co-producer, not to look at the footage because I have Adobe Premiere. I can't yeah. edit. She hadn't chosen me as the editor yet. She was thinking I was paying someone to edit. I was like, okay, if you don't have enough money, listen, I am here if you want me to do it. I can edit, you know? Yeah. I was back up. But what you have to do is not look at the footage on a laptop. If you do that on a laptop, it will, on your Apple laptop, it will format it to Final Cut. And oh. I won't be able to look at it on Adobe, which is on my PC. Yeah. She said, yeah, yeah, no, I won't do that. I wonder, what did she do? She went and she did it because, because we had three dates that were all very separated by a couple of months because of people's uh, schedules clashing. And so she was dying to look at it. So then she looked at it. <laughs> so I was just like, I can't look at this footage. Because she asked me to edit then in the end. And uh, I couldn't look at it. I couldn't open it up. So uh. I didn't look at the footage and she did. And so then it was corrupted. Um <laughs> And That's now, the experience I've just had because yeah. I, I looked at my stuff from 18 months ago and it was all out of sync and it wasn't a case of going and tweaking something. 
everything, every shot was totally out of sync. And I'd gone from Final Cut Pro to Adobe and I'm now on Adobe. So those those are fascinating insights of the of the, of the problems that you that you actually do have, you know, with those sort of things. But and again, my wife happens to be a midwife. <laughs> so okay. so I, I appreciate that idea of birthing a movie and getting it out there and how difficult the labor is to try and get yeah. to, that whole thing going. So I love that kind of analogy of the whole thing. But you you did you did manage to succeed with that film, you know, yeah, yeah. It through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it finally came out. I was quite happy with it. I had it. So what happened was um, I had it uncorrupted by uh, the DOP. The DOP knew what to do, so he was able to. But it took him a whole, like, 48 hours or something. <laughs> he was in the middle of another. Uh, and, and accountancy speak there is 48 hours, seven hours. You know, that's a week's work at, you know, 500 quid a day, three grand a budget done by a favour. You know, but the great, the, the, that's the thing is, if, the community that you're working with or on these low budget movies they're this is their testimonial they're they're willing to give back they're willing to pay forward or but as you said if you have a mortgage if you've got that real baby crying in the corner you've got to be able to feed it that's that's the hardness in in the production so like we're entering the market now going there's a particular pain in anything under a million quid to get made it cannot find the investors because the, i as an accountant i'm going they don't, they can't even hear what the return might be. Actually, there's an interesting article about Netflix yesterday, or again by Stephen Fellows or Follows, and it, he was saying, this is what they want. And what they're, they've taken away the upside, they might buy the production, but what they're interested in is the audience you're bringing to translate into subscribers to them. If it cannot be evidence in your pitch, then you will not even get heard it's because there's so many pitching to them to get access to their end audience yeah. it, particularly as an indie producer so what was what one interesting thing was was is they're actually what's actually breaking through is the likes of people that have their own followers on youtube as actors or, or yes are you actually be, be, being actually um put in as actors i should say so are you looking to sort of maybe get your next feature with a couple of YouTube influencers hidden in it to have their pre-audience or is it just staying to the mainstream actors we give them their day rate of equity? No, I'm not necessarily into YouTube. I don't know anything about YouTube or, you know, influencers or anything I find. I think they're funny, but I mean, I don't, I don't really know much about them. And uh, I mean, I like, like, as I say, I, I, I just go with my intuition. So I, I, I write something I really, really love. And then I go out and I try to find the actors who are right for it. And Finish. again, just yeah. like I pray a lot. I just gonna go, God, is this? Is this <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you're a cat. I don't know if you're a Catholic or a girl. You pray a lot. Who are you praying to? Are you actually just? Is that? Is, are you religious? Are you praying, or is it just that's a self affirmation and going, please, universe, will you sort this one out for me? Well, it's it's it's, it's trying to listen to your kind of intuition and you know, in yeah. you know, to your gut, which I think is your connection to God. You know, so yeah, yeah. Um, try to always keep within that. I think. Um, you're talking to you're talking to an atheist on one hand, yeah, and yeah. you're talking to a deacon in training on the That's other. Nice. <laughs> I'm, actually, I, I resent that now. I'm an agnostic Why? atheist. You know, you're I'm, I'm going to hedge my atheist. bets. You know, I, I've got the two coins for my eyes for the last day to bribe the ferryman, <laughs> and you know, I, I'm going to be forgiven if I can just stay He's awake long me enough for the and funeral. ask for forgiveness. You know. <laughs> But um, no, it's, 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 what's interesting is, um, like, you're going, we're, we're asking the universe or we're asking God for a little bit of help to get over the hurdle so to make something good. Because we believe in ourselves and we believe in others. So the, well, that's what I'm really hearing there. It's you believe in your story, it needs to get made, it needs to get seen. And it needs to be the right people. It's not at any cost. Yeah, yeah, there's happy accidents, isn't there? I mean, because all the way through my career, it's happy accidents that have ha I mean, we've made, we, we're getting close to 100 podcasts. You know, we're, we're nearly there, which we've been doing this last year. And there's no way you could have worked out who, you, who we were going to get. It's just all by chance. So we're working yeah. by the same sort of principles. And all of a sudden, these doors open up that you just never imagined. And you're getting to meet some amazing people through through this this activity that we're doing. But we're also able to use it as research to, to develop our particular model of how we want to make films and move things forward. But it is it is that kind of, uh, in Garvin's case, whatever the universe is going to open to us. And and in, in, in my case, it's it's allowing God to come in and the Holy Spirit to take over the process 
and and move you forward. And uh, one of the things I'm finding is, is fascinating because I kind of worried at one point was there a was there a conflict between the spiritual side of what I was doing and the and the filmmaking. And I'm finding they complement each other like nobody's business. So you have to go with the flow. It's interesting. I find lots of people kind of feel guilty about being creative or something. But I'm like, you know, what did God do? He only created like, you know, so it's kind of, it's part of the natural expansion and breadth of him. So I wouldn't distrust yes. it. Absolutely. You know, so, so long as you're not hurting anyone, you know, there's nothing. Yes. Now, actually, I'm going to jump back to, I've just realized why there was three whiskeys and it's, it's, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is what's going yes. on here. <laughs> you know. And they're all having a good time because the whisk is Irish. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, I have, I have, I'm one of three sisters, and um, my dad, at Christmas time, whenever he wanted us to go to sleep because we were so excited for Santa, he would just give us uh, like a tiny bit of, he, he'd go, do you want a whiskey? And we'd be like, yeah. <laughs> he'd give us like, tiny hot whiskeys that he'd just kind of pour out from his own. And, we'd be like, and they wonder why we, we we have this perception as a nation of alcohols. We go, <laughs> we're feeding the babies hot whiskeys, you know. And again, the point again is in the pub as well. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so we're the on the we're on the journey of your. Actually, you've said some positive things a little bit earlier on. Being you've got the the short to feature jump. You've got the interest of the the, the national you know screen skills and or screen Ireland and and the bodies that matter to give you that soft money. So there are win win wins across the board. You've got to get out of jail free cards. You're on the journey to find the co the, the, as you said the team because it's the it's the other side to now fulfil that. So you're going out to pitch it. So yeah. I mean. You know, are you, where are you in that journey now? Is it a case of have you got your team to go, your pitch team, you might as well say, to go find that next bunch? Or have you a fair few ideas of who those people already are? No, no, not at all. So, so it's myself and Jan, we're the co writer of that, uh, of it's called Fair Game, which is what mm. girls must become. So basically, it's, it's just finding the right producer and the right production house, and then they'll know all of this stuff that you're kind of talking about the business side, you know, and they can bother about all of that. And I, all I bother about is the integrity of the piece, you know, and um, and and of executing it as well as I possibly can. Um, so actually, there is a question. I'm going. What are you bringing them? What what is it that you're pitching to them? That's what I want to know because I don't under see. This is the bit I don't understand as being a newbie to the industry. You're going. You have a script. It's been accepted by. It's understood by some a part of the industry that they're willing to support some soft money. So what opportunity are you bringing? to this other bunch of people that are going to solve all the business problems and customers and money and investors? I suppose, you know, an exciting new talent who's earned her stripes, you know, and who's ready to, you know, make a bold statement and make a, you know, a beautiful piece of art. All right, what roles are you now? There's an interesting thing. Are you just bringing the script? Are you saying I'm attached as co-producer, writer, director in any way or form? No, I'm, well, I'm attached as co-writer and as director. Right, that's it. So you've got those pre- um, like uh, conditions going in, you need to find uh, co-production partners that are willing to let you be producer, to be be director. Well, yeah. So Three Hot Whiskies wouldn't necessarily be attached to it as as a yeah. production house behind it because you know we've only opened this year properly. So, I mean, I don't have to attach as a producer. So I'm just a director and co-writer. So I'm just a creative on it. You know, so I don't. I mean, I would learn from them then as we, you know, go along about the business side of stuff and that type of thing. But gotcha. what I am... Bringing- well, I, I suppose I, I'm, say, I'm going to be terrible and see what you're saying is I want two wages from this gig in terms of the investor's money. I wasn't even thinking of money. I, like, I mean, I don't even get paid for it. Oh, you're working for free? Good, that's grand. That's, no, that's fine. We, 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 I did a screen artist short there recently and I didn't, you know, make any money yeah. from it. You know, you put all your money into the film, put everything that's into it. That's it. So you're going in as investor as well. As, as that's the thing, you, you can see yourself being a co-investor in that production. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I I give, give my salary to it. You know, I would. Yes, yes. because that that's something they love to hear. The weird thing is because the investor likes to hear that because otherwise he sees that, no, it's not it's not you would be you get paid your salary, but you can put it back in as an investment. It's the tax man wants his cut. He can he won't let you invest his money. But because it's a it's a it's a real production. Actually, the next question I'd be asking is: Is it a section four eight one production? By the sounds of it, it's a drama. It's a it's a thriller drama type. Of age drama, yeah. Yeah. But you you think it's of a size beyond core of a million quid, therefore probably a section four eight one tax credit type production. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 
Yeah. Would you, I mean, um, we're talking about scripts and that, and one of the things that Garvin and I are starting to to do, because each of the films that I've worked on, I went through and, and worked out what the budget was of, of that script, and we we modified the script based on what we thought we could achieve with the resources that we had available to us, and anything that was too outlandish got cut out. Um, I mean, have, have you got an idea of your film budget based on the experiences of working on the other projects that you've got? Would you be able to estimate what you think that that uh, film would cost? Fair game. I think, well, I, I think we could shoot fair game for one million. Um, I mean, we could shoot for less, but it's just when you're paying people. So I've, I've just done a few couple of funded shorts recently. And when you're paying people, it actually is even worse than an indie film. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because yeah. uh, it just, you know, you, you can't pay people the right amount anyways. And because you're paying them, they'll only stick around for a certain amount of days. It's not like you can spread your shoot out over like maybe a month or two and take it easy. You know, you can't do that. So, I mean, it's it just makes it every everything quite difficult. So a million is still strong. There's a big ask for 800,000 yeah. from investors. Yeah. You know, which the, that's what we're finding. It's the, the statistics, even against Stephen Fellow's statistics says under 2 million you might have directors which are first time directors but investors are not really investing in it because they don't understand how they're going to get their money back a million to get back at the box office is at 7 cent or 10 cent a view is 50 million customers you know based on netflix statistics or or, or the figures that we can figure out so what what's really going on there is is does this have a 10 to 50 million audience out there that will watch it so the investor could get his million back. Not his million back. He's not inter he's interested in 10 million back and 5 million back and 2 million back because he can get 50% put in his pension in the morning. You know, no risk. So this is the weird business you're now in with the co-producers. You're going, how do I attract someone's million pounds to my story that I get a 50 grand wage out of for doing six months of work on it? You know, it's what it starts translating back into. And that's what why... We're, everyone we're talking to is there's not there's not there's not great stories and breakout opportunities what it is 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 the whole game is wrapped in whose money is it who's paying the wage who's paying for this opportunity and will they get their money back do you feel it's getting harder or easier well i've, I've never really gotten paid from filmmaking so it's all the same to me well <laughs> do you want to get paid from filmmaking i mean i would like yeah i mean obviously i would yeah. but uh, I mean, that's the dream, like, but at yeah. the same time, if you think like that, you're not going to make anything. You know, an awful lot of this kind of financial talk is, you know, really, really for like just a, a seasoned producer, really. Yeah. I mean, you're talking to a director. I'm, I'm an artist, so, you know. Right, <laughs> that's it. No, but you've done a great casting is as artists, <laughs> you've stepped into the realm of all the other roles because you couldn't wait for someone to give you the money. You've yeah. actually took yeah. on all yeah. the other business roles. Yeah, and I, I mean, producer, but I mean, I, I was just production managing so I could kind of get the film made, like, you know, so that's, so, so that's basically it. But. it. Well, there you go. As we were speking, you're in demand, which is a great thing about it. And I really appreciate your time, Mo. And as I said, we've learned a lot from you. And we, we're, we're watching keenly from the edges, you know, your progress. <laughs> Thanks for your insights for what you've been doing. Uh, actually, it is motivating us. It, it's, I think that's really, really good. That we've heard from you and what you're saying and i, th I think um there's a lot of things that, that that you're able to offer through this conversation to other filmmakers who are, who are trying to do the same kind of thing especially that thing about encouragement and i like what you were talking about uh seeing a film as, as a baby about to be given birth to and I, I i it resonates with me because of the connections i've got so i thought that was fantastic so look thanks for your time today we really do appreciate that Okay. Thanks so a lot, Mo. Really appreciate that. Best of luck with Fair Game. And have three whiskeys on us. Right? Take care. All the best. Thanks a lot, Ben. Bye for now. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications.